I want to welcome everyone today to today's national webinar hosted by the ATC National Coordinating Resource Center, presented by the ATC program. Once again, my name is Liz Lazo. Today's session is part of the HIV and COVID-19 Winter Webinar Series. I would like to let, now introduce today's speakers. Dr. Mark Allen Berry, Melody Barr, and Brett Feldman. One second, please. Dr. Mark Allen Berry is the Chief Innovation Officer at Access Health Louisiana. He specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of HIV and AIDS, hepatitis C, STIs, as well as HEP and PrEP. He is the founder of 102.3 WHIV FM, a radio station dedicated to human rights and social justice. Melody Barr is the Deputy Assistant Director for Public Services in Houston, Texas, partnering with nonprofits and local government agencies to deliver services to Houston's low and moderate income populations. She oversees the program operations for the City of Houston's Emergency Solutions Grant, Community Development Block Grant Public Services, House Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, Texas Homeless Housing Services Program, and other special grants. related to homelessness and special needs populations, including CARES Act funding and disaster recovery funds. Brett Feldman is the director of the Street Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California and serves as the vice chair of the Street Medicine Institute. He has practiced homelessness, homeless medicine for 11 years and founded Three programs, including the DeSales University Free Clinic, Lehigh Valley Health Network Street Medicine in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and recently at the Keck, Uni Keck School of Medicine. So before I go ahead and turn it over to um, Dr. Mark Allen Derry, I'm going to go ahead and mute the lines. And Dr. Derry, if you can unmute yourself um, once I mute the lines. The leader has muted your line. To unmute your line, press pound six. Hello? Oh, sorry, I'm, yeah, big. So Can I'll you hear me? Over to you now. Yes. Awesome, thank you. And how do I, uh, there we go. Okay. okay, awesome. Thank you so much. It, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I was asked to speak a bit about HIV, uh, COVID-19, and housing instability. So uh, it's a pleasure to do so, and it's a pleasure to be with, um, uh, on with such esteemed uh, uh, other co-speakers uh, as well. So I have no disclosures uh, to uh, disclose. Today we're going to quickly just go over uh, looking at the morbidity and mortality of hospitalizations um, associated with COVID-19, so basic epidemiology. Um, we'd like to also then uh, look at what um, – the uh, COVID experience has been for people living with HIV with some very uh, well, some very nice studies uh, uh, that mostly have shown that people living with HIV have not um, fared any uh, uh, worse, or in other words, that their experience with COVID has been very much like the population uh, not living with HIV. Um, we're going to quickly then talk about evictions and how uh, uh, people living with HIV uh, who are uh, uh, evicted uh, do have uh, poor outcomes, and then ultimately uh, acknowledge that the impending eviction crisis at the end of 2020 can significantly increase COVID infections, especially for people living with uh, HIV. So very briefly, uh, uh, these slides were taken two days ago. These numbers are slightly different, but as of a couple days ago, we had 17 million uh, cases here in the U.S. With deaths are well north of 300,000 uh, here. Uh, the cases are, uh, new cases are uh, exceeding, at some points, even 200,000. I think yesterday we had 200,000 cases, and then new deaths were about 3,000 plus deaths. So we're really in the throes of, of, the, uh, of the pandemic, especially as you can see here in this map. 
which uh, l is looking at the entire country, you'll see that all 49 states, including D.C., have uncontrolled spread of COVID-19, with Hawaii just trending poorly. So uh, things are, of course, going to uh, get worse. What we're seeing here is the effect from Thanksgiving, uh, as you can see here in, uh, in this slide, where there was a little bit of a dip uh, here, and then there's been a significant increase. But we're at a seven-day average of 211,000. 629 uh, average uh, seven-day average cases, with our case rates being 65.3 per 100,000. I remember when that number was like three, and then five, and then 13, and it stayed in the teens for a really long time during summer, and then now has just been going, <laughs> getting higher and higher. And uh, again, we are going to see a, a significant uptick as a result of Christmas. But uh, looking at the daily uh, case counts of COVID. Um, we are at a point where uh, we are breaking new records every day. Uh, again, this is, uh, does not bode well for how things are going, uh, and things are likely to get worse before they get better. Cases are increasing by 31% daily. Deaths are increasing 65%, uh, and hospitalizations are increasing as well. I'm sure you're probably experiencing that in your own uh, facilities as well. Here you see our uh, daily ca uh, case count with respect to mortality, and we're breaking, again, breaking records uh, regularly. We just broke another record just a couple of days ago um, in terms of the number of deaths. We are at a point where we're going to significantly be surpassing the first wave of, um, of uh, the epidemic, not necessarily because we have uh, uh, regressed. Uh, we certainly have gotten a lot better with being able to care for people living with HIV. I'm sorry, with uh, people living, uh, people infected with COVID. Uh, it's just that the numbers are so high at this point uh, that uh, if you have a 1% to 2% mortality rate, you're going to expect to see these numbers uh, increase. And expect these to go uh, mortality to continue for some time because, um, of course, mortality is a, a, a lagging indicator. Um, looking at the daily hospital uh, counts, um, uh, again, hospitalization has increased significantly over the course of the last uh, um, uh, a couple of months uh, where we've significantly surpassed uh, the, uh, we significantly surpassed uh, the first two uh, uh, waves uh, as well with respect to hospitalization. And then when you put it all together, again, daily case counts uh, are significantly high. That goes along with significant elevated uh, in hospitalizations, and then, of course, daily deaths are increasing uh, as well. So focusing on uh, people living uh, with, uh, with HIV, um, could they uh, have worse outcomes with COVID-19? And initially, we were very, obviously, we were very, very concerned of uh, looking at folks that uh, uh, people living with HIV and COVID. Uh, and the idea was, um, you know, people with lower T cell counts uh, or those that were not virally uh, suppressed, what, what would happen? Um, and uh, we were unclear as to how much of an immunosuppression could uh, serve as a risk factor for severe COVID-19. Um, and then some of the other uh, factors there was that we were also concerned uh, specifically in that uh, people living with HIV, 50% uh, of those people are over the age of 50. People living with HIV have higher rates of risk factors that uh, portend to more severe uh, COVID-19 or even uh, can predict mortality. And then, of course, higher rates of poverty and uh, uh, housing instability uh, as well. So those were all things that were going into COVID we were particularly concerned about. Um, and could, you know, but then the flip side is could people living with HIV have better outcomes with COVID, right? That was, that's the other side. Uh, I was a little bit more on the previous slide. I was a little bit more concerned. I was a little less optimistic. But, you know, going into COVID, there was some, you know, there was some consideration that perhaps folks that were uh, virally suppressed on good antiretrovirals uh, could potentially uh, uh, be pr predictive, uh, uh, protective. Uh, with respect to uh, COVID, uh, and we think that we may have seen that in the early trials, uh, lapinavir with ritonavir, uh, which uh, was marketed uh, in the past as a drug called Kaletra, was being used uh, and studied, uh, but those studies ended up showing that there was no difference for those folks that were taking lapinavir co-formulated with ritonavir, uh, that, there was, that they did not do any better. But it, it, the idea was an using antiretrovirals for um, COVID-19 uh, may have had some sort of protective effect. So quick, quick uh, review some of the studies. So these were mostly all retrospective studies. 
And uh, here in this uh, one study uh, in, uh, in New York City during the peak of the epidemic uh, in, in New York, um, there was really no difference uh, with respect to, I wish I had a pointer here, <laughs> uh, there was really no difference with respect to those people living with HIV and those that, oh, cool, how can I, uh, that's, and you can see here that there was no difference uh, with respect to people living with HIV and those that didn't have HIV. Um, here's a study that uh, was in Spain, uh, one of the largest uh, to date, uh, and again, uh, HIV did not uh, increase susceptibility to uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, and did not uh, uh, affect the outcome uh, as well. And the authors thought, was, could this have been an effect of antiretrovirals? So in this study, they actually looked at antiretrovirals, and what they found was that those individuals that were on tenofovir uh, had better outcomes uh, as opposed to those that were on TAF. So uh, tenofovir was really kind of the thing that we started looking at and wondering, uh, uh, were those folks that were on PrEP or those folks that, um, you know, those folks that, uh, uh, who were taking tenofovir as part of their backbone uh, on their uh, antiretrovirals, uh, was that, you know, what was protective about it? But the flip side is that those people who have been started on TAF may have been switched uh, to TAP because they may have had some comorbidities uh, with respect to um, uh, being on long-term tenofovir. So could there have been, uh, could have those folks that, uh, could the folks that have been on tenofovir had a more, um, uh, was that more of a healthier uh, population? And then the one study that kind of turned everything around was this one here in South Africa that actually showed that those people living with HIV um, and I don't know where my cursor went, but those people that were living with HIV did actually have a higher propensity, thank you, that did have a higher propensity uh, for uh, mortality. So HIV was a risk factor. So for the most part, it's, it's mostly, I think that, um, uh, you know, the way that we can overall look at it, the, uh, as it says here, the, the literature suggests that at least in Europe and North, Africa, North America, HIV does not increase risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, as we understand now, most of the studies document a high prevalence of comorbidities with people with HIV and severe COVID-19, suggesting that this may be a major driver of morbidity and mortality. The study from South Africa is concerning, and future studies will need to be, um, need to be determined. But I think taken together, the picture emerges that there's not much of a difference in the incidence or clinical manifestations of people living with HIV compared to those that don't have HIV. So how about looking at those individuals that are um, moving into uh, 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 evictions and, and housing and stability? We uh, know that um, moving forward uh, with respect to this moratorium that could be lifted, there's an estimated number of uh, 30 to 40, 40 million renters that could potentially be at risk uh, for, uh, uh, for eviction. Uh, and uh, what we do know in the past is that eviction disprop evictions disproportionately uh, impacts black and Latinx rent uh, renters, uh, as well as you can see in these orange bars, as well as those uh, individuals that uh, also uh, have uh, children. There's a, a negative impact, of course, uh, that uh, can occur to your health due to uh, eviction, such as physical health, mental health, uh, conditions associated uh, or conditions uh, unique to women, uh, conditions associated and unique to children, and, and just exposure to substandard living conditions uh, as well. So these are some of the issues that we see with uh, evictions. And, and this nice little graph here kind of takes you through the process of, you know, kind of what happens, your job wage or loss, uh, or some sort of pre-existing affordable housing crisis leads to increased uh, rent burden, increased eviction, increased housing, which leads to increased uh, transiency, um, which leads to public or shared facilities or crowded residual environments, which means there's an inability to adhere to CDC pandemic control. And then uh, the unfortunate uh, case here is that this could tend to, uh, potentially lead to COVID-19 transmission, which will likely increase infection and mortality uh, as well. This was a, a study that I actually uh, presented uh, as I do weekly uh, the mayor's office here in New Orleans. This, so this is uh, taken from my personal slide deck. 
Uh, and what this slide is showing essentially is that since the eviction uh, moratoriums have been lifted, as you can see here in this blue line, um, there's been an increase uh, in infection rates of COVID-19, uh, especially those amongst those that have been evicted. And then those who've been evicted, there was also a, a notable and associated increase in mortality rate uh, as well, uh, which is easily per, uh, predicted. Uh, since um, there's a, a, in prepping for the slides uh, in this lecture, I uh, discovered this amazing website called Eviction Lab. Uh, what they do is they've been looking, they've been tracking evictions, and they look at 27 cities. And what they found is that since uh, the 27 cities that they tracked, there's been 162,563 evictions just during the pandemic, and that's just in, uh, in 27, uh, uh, again, in 27 uh, cities. Um, and uh, just last week, landlords uh, in those 27 cities have filed for 3,526 uh, evictions, again, just in the, in the past week. Um, what we do know is that uh, county level uh, associations between eviction rates uh, in 2014 and rates of other STIs uh, increase as well. So in other words, uh, we, we do uh, have a, um, a robust uh, body of evidence suggesting that when uh, individuals experience eviction and housing instability, we do see rates, uh, and here in this study, rates of STIs, chlamydia and gonorrhea particularly, do uh, increase uh, as a result uh, of uh, uh, as a result of being evicted, um, and then here we see that housing instability also affects viral loads. The green line are those individuals with um, uh, good viral suppression, uh, and those are have the uh, most stable housing. Uh, you can see then here in this yellow line the at the bottom here um, that those individuals have less uh, stable. Thank you. Have less stable um, viral loads. Uh, due to uh, housing uh, instability. <clears throat> um, also, uh, looking uh, at the relationship between uh, evictions and HIV transmission, uh, and what uh, this study uh, found uh, particularly was that evictions uh, essentially made it harder for people to adhere uh, to antiretroviral therapy. So, uh, again, somewhat uh, problematic. Um, and the authors concluded that evictions independently increase the odds of detectable HIV viral load. So again, that's something that uh, is not uh, uh, a surprise there. Uh, looking at Louisiana specifically, we've uh, been at the highest rates of, um, of HIV for the past uh, um, at 20 years, really, 15 since I've been here. Uh, but in the last decade, we've actually really done better in terms of uh, new incidents of, of, H uh, of HIV. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, we do have the uh, highest rates. We do have uh, highest rates of homelessness here in the state, as well as some very high eviction rates. And so using the Eviction Lab uh, website, again, trying to look at Louisiana uh, to, to, to determine. And our state score at state <laughs> was zero out of five. Uh, we were one of the worst uh, states. In other words, the state really leans very much in favor of, um, of, of landlords, quite frankly. And they just go through a number of, um, of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> laws that uh, really uh, that uh, really bode poorly for uh, renters. Uh, and so, you know, these are just a series of slides I just added, just really for uh, if for those that are interested, um, that, to see how poorly, at least in a state like Louisiana, which is also one of the poor states uh, in the nation as well. Uh, and that, that uh, as well as the unhealthiest uh, state uh, as well, even though we're slightly better with respect to our HIV, we, um, we see here that housing and health care are really, um, really uh, quite tied in uh, uh, quite closely with one another. So just re quick review here, um, just, you know, we looked at the increased morbidity, mortality, and hospitalizations. We are in the throes of a significant uh, pandemic. I know that we all know that. Uh, but it is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, there is, I think at this point, safe to say there's not much difference in the incidence or the clinical manifestations of people living with HIV compared with those who don't have HIV. Uh, evictions for people living with HIV are deleterious to maintaining health, uh, and an impending eviction crisis at the end of 2020 uh, will significantly increase COVID-19 infections, especially for people living uh, with HIV. So I'm going to pass this on to Ms. Melody Barr. And thank you guys so much for the opportunity.
Great. Thank you, Dr. Berry. Melody? Sorry about that. And I do want to start by saying that I'm having some difficulties looking at the slides, so I may have to go blind on this. I do see it right now. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start, and hopefully everything, um, this is what, live audience, so the show must go on. Um, so uh, let's see if I can do this. All right. We are, there's no, okay, this is no conflict, I believe. And then this slide should be the objective slide. And if you guys can just um, make sure I'm um, on the right slide, that would be great. And we're going to go over um, some housing subsidy that we currently have in the city of Houston. We're going to describe some barriers to housing. And then we're going to describe the current solutions and opportunities. So this slide should be the homeless to housing slide. Um, housing and Community Development Department for the City of Houston receives roughly $20 million annually for public services activities. HIV-specific funding makes up approximately half of this money. Recently, our funding has gone up tremendously due to CARES funding to address issues related to COVID and, the, and with the additional funds to a disaster you may have heard of a couple of years ago named Hurricane Harvey. The funding um, in our portfolio has increased to over $100 million and it keeps growing. So this is sort of one of those double-edged swords. It's a, it's a blessing and sometimes it's uh, slightly a curse, but uh, we will continue to look at it as a blessing. Public service activities include anything from job training, legal services, child care services, to housing services, which may include rent, subsidy. Essentially, what we would call ourselves, we say we're the non-bricks and sticks, meaning we're not um, paying to nail hammers and pour concrete. The Public Services Group is currently funding approximately 90 different programs, most of which are nonprofit agencies. Homeless services is a major part of our programming. We serve this vulnerable population with a variety of funds as it is complex and a challenging issue. Last program year, our department funded programs that provided services to approximately 38,000 house households as reported. The first picture is of two homeless persons under a tree, not far from a major freeway. These two individuals are United States veterans. When we think about homeless issues, we must also remember that this is not just a social issue, but it is also a national security issue as well. And we have, we have a voluntary military, and if we cannot take care of them when they come home, how are we ensuring we get the best to and less? The second picture is of a man sleeping on a freeway, uh, Cedar Street. We call it Cedars in Texas. I'm not sure uh, what the rest of the nation calls it. Um, he indicated that this was the safest place to get some rest since there is nowhere to, um, since there's nowhere to park and people wouldn't bother him. So I took both of these pictures. We took these pictures about uh, 4.45 in the morning, um, maybe it was 5. And I was parked illegally on the sidewalk, and we had to do that in order to engage this individual. What I will say, though, about that first picture is those two people, those two veterans did get housed. The other picture you see here is of housing that was purposely built to house persons that are homeless. Solving housing insecurities means that we must have, you know, that we have to increase the affordable housing stock. Increasing affordable housing stock should not be government housing as we know it, but building a place that you would house the person you love the most or even yourself in. This slide should be about housing opportunities of persons with AIDS. Is that correct? I'm going to tell you that. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, HAPWA, as we, as we call it, is a program that was established in 1990. The statutory purpose states that it provides states and localities or resources and incentives to devise long-term comprehensive strategies for meeting the housing needs of persons with acquired immune deficiency syndrome and families of such persons. The HOPLA program serves low-income persons and their families living with HIV or AIDS. Households must be below 80% area median income, and HIV AIDS status must be documented. So this does have to come from reliable document sources. Those are the two eligibility criteria. I will say in the city of Houston and in many other jurisdictions across the nation, um, that 80% is sometimes reduced. In Houston, it's reduced to 50% for housing activities. We keep it at 80% for the social service type of activities and emergency um, needs. Houston receives approximately $10 million annually for this program. 
Um, but our area consists of nine counties. So though $10 million may sound to some like it's a lot, it is a very large jurisdiction that we cover. With these funds, we provide program activities such as tenant-based rental assistance, which is long-term housing or very similar to a Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher. We have what we call short-term rent mortgage utility assistance, and that's right. We also provide assistance for mortgages if, you, uh, if, a, if a client um, is unable to pay. So this is that emergency assistance. When we find clients who um, are about to have their lights cut off or they are um, facing eviction, they've missed a payment, and we're there to help them. We also provide funding to community residences, which are essentially apartment complexes. You see the picture above. and. And that's exactly what that is. Those are multifamily units. Those are apartment complex designated and developed specifically for persons living with AIDS. And um, you shouldn't be able to tell those apartments apart from any other apartment. We also provide support services such as case management. And case management is one of those funny words that can mean a lot of things. But in this case, it's really related to housing and case management, legal aid services, nutrition services, and much more. The HOPA program is currently funding in Houston 15 programs, and it provides housing assistance and support services to over 1,800 households, of which 1,572 were served with direct housing assistance. And that number is important to us because we monitor that number. Um, but the story behind it is that they, they are numbers, but they're people, right? And, and sometimes we lose sight uh, as funders or uh, as reports continue to get filed. That's 1,572 people that didn't have to choose, do I pay for my medication this month or do I pay my rent? Uh, we came in and we paid for that housing assistance. It's not enough and we must be better. So this is just one funding stream or one program that is available for persons living with AIDS that are unstably housed or as we say, housing insecure. What I see from providers in Houston that I work with, and I don't think it's much different across the nation, is that clients are often being referred to HOPA programs only or aid-specific programs only, but not many are being referred or highly encouraged to apply for mainstream programs. Other programs may ask a client if they're living with HIV or AIDS, but that is not a requirement to disclose, and in most cases, it does not put them at a higher vulnerability index. However, this is an avenue in which everyone in the homeless system should try to use. Okay, so this next slide should be barriers to housing, and um, so clearly there's not enough affordable housing stock, and, and this is huge, right, because um, how can we expect someone who is, um, who is trying to make ends meet and help themselves afford something when it's just not available? So that is a huge barrier to housing. Across the board, um, there appears to be a lack of affordable housing um, prior to the pandemic in Houston. Houston ranks fifth in the nation and first in Texas for having the most severe affordable housing shortage. The city has 19 affordable housing units for every 100 households in need, or about 80% um, deficit, according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Huge. COVID-19 has also been a barrier, as many um, I, I, I'm sure have seen in their own ways. Uh, it's changed things rapidly, very rapidly for our community. Um, it, is essential, it is essentially like we are flying a plane as we are building up. The stay-at-home orders have also uh, created some barriers, and those barriers are because our, our, our system saw a significant decrease in referrals um, and with potential clients accessing services. Everyone was sent home, including case managers, and so there were many people available, and when we came back, it was very challenging trying to reassess and reprogram our systems and our program. Um, with the eviction moratorium, um, there was also a decrease in ask for um, assistance. Um, in addition, there wasn't available documentation to prove that rent was late or evictions were even occurring. So we are still limited by federal rules and the federal parameters of what we need to be able to service individuals. We have, uh, we've seen um, the higher unemployment insurance. Uh, and one of our local agencies pointed out that clients were more likely to choose the path of least resistance as it relates to the complexity of a program application process. The unemployment benefits require substantially less amounts of paperwork than what is needed to qualify for a HOPLA 
program or any other federal program. The clients have opted to use that. Immigration continues to be an issue of concern in our area. According to our local providers, many of the households in the immigrant community are reporting experiencing stress over conducting daily activities such as grocery shopping, keeping medical appointments, or going to the pharmacy to pick up their medication. Due to fears regarding deportation, many undocumented persons living with HIV clients have indicated that they have ceased receiving their Ryan White funded care. Um, technology barriers. I don't know about you, but all of our clients don't have the hardware. They don't have the hardware or the software. Um, they can possibly get Wi-Fi, but even Wi-Fi is a challenge, and I have Wi-Fi. It is a challenge for me today. Uh, or know how to navigate in this new remote tech world. And so uh, we used to talk about digital divide being who has Wi-Fi and who doesn't, um, but now it's more who has the software, who has, um, who has the hardware, and do you even know how to do it. And then there's respite care, right? So Houston does not have an HIV-specific respite care facility, which is definitely needed in our system. And um, so that is definitely a gap and, and a barrier. We need to be able to help people. So that's all my doom and gloom. And then um, I do want to share some housing solutions, which I hope you can see on the screen. So some, you know, we're working hard. Um, I have a great team behind me working hard as well. What you should be looking at is our point in time count, and it is a graph. And it's comparing our homeless activity from 2011 to 2019. And some of the key findings is that um, our system has been able to decrease the overall homelessness um, by 54%. 41% of the individuals experiencing homelessness were living unsheltered. So that tells us that we have a lot more work to do. 17,000 people have been placed in permanent supportive housing since 2011. So 17,000 people that don't have to go look for housing anywhere else. Um, and there's no um, rush to leave because they can permanently live there. 23% of individuals experiencing homeless were young adults aged 18 to 24. And there were no families with minor children nor unaccompanied youth living on the street on the night of the count. And so we do this count every January. This count is required by, uh, by HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department, so that cities like Houston, any jurisdiction, can continue to re, um, receive funding. Um, so we have a lot more work to do. I talked to you a little bit about additional CARES funding that was, that has come into the department. And so funded by the city of Houston and Harris County and private philanthropy, um, a joint $65 million plan has been established to add capacity to house um, 5,000 people experiencing homelessness over the next two years to limit the spread of COVID-19. So the community, um, they call it CHIP. We love our acronym for so the CHIP program. Um, it will permanently house people who are currently experiencing literal homelessness, which is living on the street, living in shelter, um, as well as encampments, and those that fall into homelessness. So again, that's that risk category that if you're and if you lose your job and you're not able to pay your rent and now you're falling into homelessness this program will um, hopefully catch you to um, to help you and so as they fall into homelessness as a result of economic sex to the coronavirus but we still don't know what the long-term impact of the 719 will be on the homeless system or HIV system in our region we do anticipate an increased need for housing so we're looking at different ways to do this in different models such as diversion uh, some of our anticipated outcomes from the CHIP program um, is to end our chronic homelessness and reduce an encampment. And this is over a two-year period. Expanded targeted outreach in unappropriated areas, reducing high-cost emergency services for people, and creating 150 jobs through this program, as well as setting a path to making homelessness in our community rare, brief, and non-recurring. And what I can tell you is that our department has worked really hard with the funding that we've received, and it's not specific to HIV but it doesn't preclude anyone who, who is living with HIV um, to access it. So over probably the next three years um, in times, and this is in, within development, I talked about the lack of affordable housing stock. Um, in total, we have about 30 projects that are going to be receiving funding from our department to create over 3,500 units, and I'll just repeat that again, 3,500 units will be created, um, including 3,100 of those units reserved for low to moderate income households. And that's how we 
help with the solutions of affordable housing. Um, it actually represents over a billion dollars worth of development, and that's because we do uh, leverage funding and we layer this funding with tax credits and another funding that we that come in. And with all those units, it still doesn't solve the problem um, because as much as we put the units out that are affordable, there there just still isn't enough, and so we have to get creative. And I will say, I talked about the CHIP program, and this is just like hot off the press, and this is from about two hours ago. Uh, we started this program October 1st, um, and not every agency that we have funded is up and running yet. They're still hiring. Um, to date, we have housed 207 um, households. So that has been an accomplishment. That's just a little over two months, and we're, we haven't even come to full scale. We're just um, ramping up. That concludes my presentation at this point, and I will be open to questions later. Thank you, Melody. So we're going to hold the questions to the end. We're going to go ahead, and um, I'm going to introduce uh, Brett Feldman. So the floor is yours, Brett. Great. Thank you very much. And Melody, thanks for ending on such a, a positive note. Um, and now we're going to transition to what happens when um, there it is a lack of affordable housing that we're unable to um, stop evictions. And for the folks that um, maybe started on the street during COVID-19 and, and have continued to have, have to stay on the street because we don't want to make uh, care contingent on housing. So um, the best way that we found to do this is through street medicine. Um, and I guess first we should uh, – define street medicine, but, but, but essentially street medicine recognizes that people um, experiencing homelessness, especially those who are unsheltered, um, just can't for many different reasons, most of which are um, their understandable preoccupation with survival if they don't know where they're going to sleep tonight, where their next meal is going to come from, if they're going to be safe doing those things, can't possibly begin to think about things like their health care. So in response, we uh, leave our offices and go to the people living on the streets, in the woods, under the bridges, with the goal of first delivering uh, tender love, and then the same high-quality care you would expect in a clinic, except on the street. So, um, so here's here's kind of like the official definition. Um, it's the direct del delivery of healthcare to the rough sleeping population. So this is specifically the unsheltered homeless. Care is performed on the street, so it's not in a shelter, in an RV. Um, it's not even for the unsheltered population indoors, but it's actually in their space, um, done via walking rounds, uh, depending on where you go in the world, motorcycles, horseback, kayaks. When I was in Pennsylvania, there was one youth encampment that we could only access via kayak down this uh, stream, so we, we had to get kayaks, but it doesn't matter how you get there, the, the idea is to go to the people, to suspend our reality and meet them in their reality. Um, and, and that's the only way we know for sure um, what they're experiencing and the context of, of what we're treating. So um, to, to that, a lot of people ask me, about, what about an RV? Are you guys going to get an, an RV specifically? And RV medicine is great, and it has its place. Um, but it's not street medicine. And the main reason is because when we use an RV, even if we drive to them, we are taking them out of a place where they feel comfortable and bringing them into our space um, it, that we've arranged. It's probably even licensed. Um, but we want to go to them to uh, a, a place where they feel comfortable, not necessarily where we feel comfortable. Um, more important than the care we're delivering is the values and philosophy that guide us. So we talk about patient-led care rather than patient-centered care. Um, I don't think patient-centered care started out this way, but what has happened in my mind is I picture kind of a, a patient being in this hole, and we've built up the system so high around them that we can't even see them anymore. They're in there. They're in the center, but buried deep within the uh, bureaucracy of the system. So our goal is to raise the patient's voice above that of the system. Uh, we practice reality-based medicine, and this is something that uh, the, the world of care with people uh, living with HIV has done for a long time. So we start out with evidence-based medicine, which is it's a great place to start, but life is not 
a double-blind randomized controlled study. So you start with the evidence and then you apply it to the reality of the street. We talk about having unconditional respect for the people we serve. Um, one of my street medicine colleagues that practices in Southampton, England, coined this term, one less FU. And how that works is you go to a camp and they chase you away, FU, 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 20 times. And then the next time, FU, 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 19 times. And that was a measure of success. And no matter how many times we're FU'd away, um, we still have unconditional respect for them as people. We see medicine as an instrument of peace. So just like uh, Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross can go into these war-torn areas, we go to similar areas with our stethoscopes around our necks and being seen as, as there to help. And the truth is, is that there's actually studies to show that people experiencing homelessness, part of the reason why they don't access traditional health care is because of previous negative experiences. So as much as we would love to generalize it to just, oh, they don't like institution, they don't like organization. Um, this is actually something that we've earned that is specific to healthcare. Um, we view medicine as a tool of advocacy. So there are, uh, you know, frequently that in within an hour I'll be under a bridge with a patient and then in a boardroom. Um, and when we're given the privilege to walk this journey with the people we serve, um, we see things that we can't unsee. And when we see those things, we become witnesses. And as a witness, we have the duty to come back and tell people that can't be under the bridge with us what we're seeing and experiencing. Um, so this is uh, one of our teams. Um, so you know, I mentioned different ways of kind of going around. So the optics of it is we drive around in this pickup truck. We have backpacks um, that carry all, all of our supplies. Um, like I said, we try to provide the same quality of care on the street as in the clinic. And we know healthcare is not just the office visit, so we dispense medications, draw labs, we do point of care ultrasound or EKGs on the street. Um, these are, you know, typical places that we would practice. Um, but if I was to kind of give one um, answer as to why this works, is because of our approach with radical humility. And what this looks like is, is this picture. Um, so as you can see, everybody on the team is bent down in a servant's position. Um, all of our heads are equal. In this picture, you can't tell who's the student, who's the PA, who's the doctor, who's the CEO of, of LAC USC uh, General Hospital in LA who's in this picture. But you can tell that the patient has been given the position of authority. Um, but our hierarchy is flat. So this is, this is the way that we want to practice medicine. The reason why this is so important in LA um, is because uh, we, we talked about the point in time count in some of the other cities. On the left is um, the city of Los Angeles is the, is the dark bar. And then the county goes up to that. And this is from the point in time count, uh, who was sleeping on the streets in one night. And then on the right, as you can see, the city is ticking away. It compares how the unsheltered population compares in population size to the rest of the country. Um, and despite all of these cities, um, we are still shamefully a few thousand ahead. So um, we just have this massive, massive population that all of the efforts that we that have put forth, which have been exorbitant um, during COVID, just hasn't um, even close. And one of the things that makes it even more complicated in LA is that many of many of you have heard of Skid Row. Um, when we think of homelessness in LA, we think about Skid Row. And if you've been to Skid Row, you know why. Um, it's as close to uh, hell on earth as you will find in the United States. But the truth is, is that less than 10% of all unsheltered homeless in LA live on Skid Row. Um, that means over 90% are not on Skid Row. And, but all the resources are concentrated on Skid Row. So it's very common um, for somebody that's not living on Skid Row to get maybe two or three meals a week. Um, you know, a lot of the patients we see are in, are in woods like that. And how that, so um, knowing that we have this huge population and a very diverse population in, in every sense of the word. Um, this is the, 
this is kind of the model that we built. It's a model that's designed to, to build capacity. So um, we started with a hospital-based consult service um, using trying to figure out who of these 48,000 are first, and we decided to start with who are the sickest. Um, and this is, so we have a consult service in LAC USC, which is the largest county hospital. We see the patient when they're admitted and follow them anywhere um, on the streets in the county. And this is how we started uh, building our practice for people experiencing, or people living with HIV. So we have a uh, HIV attending and HIV fellow that are with us. Um, most of the patients we pick up are admitted with AIDS-defining diagnoses. Um, and we, we meet them in the hospital with these and then follow them on the street. And we've really had great success with um, keeping them on their antiretrovirals. Um, we just, uh, one of the patients that we recently picked up um, was diagnosed with syphilis during uh, her inpatient stay. And we just gave her final injection um, on the street last week. So uh, that's something that I think we're most proud of. Of course, we have the street-based care, but we also know that we can't be the only ones doing this if we're gonna meet, uh, ever realize our vision that all unsheltered homeless in LA have access to basic health care. So we do workforce development, education. Uh, right now we have um, six area federally qualified health centers that are going through this year long workforce development. Um, and then finally research, understanding that um, street medicine is still largely an unproven model and everybody that has started has had to fight to exist and fight to survive. Maybe if there was good research, you wouldn't have to fight so hard. So knowing that this is this population is so large and, and like I said, so diverse in many, many senses, um, and how we're trying to uh, at least make a dent in it, um, we go out onto the street during COVID, and this is part of what we see. Uh, people asking us if we stay at home, who's going to feed us? Um, and, and we always talk about uh, letting the streets build the program, that the second I start to build it, it's going to be a huge embarrassing failure. So we ask the people all the time, what's it like? Um, and I think when, I, when, when, when COVID-19 first hit, there was really two main responses. Um, the first one was that they really didn't care about it, to be honest. And, and I think the reason is because they're used to these daily threats to their health and safety, um, things that are not theoretical but actually happen to them every day, much higher rates of violence, um, much higher rates of theft, you know, all these things that most of us don't have to deal with on a daily basis, that if there was going to be a, that the threshold to uh, register as a threat had to be much, much higher. Um, so a, a lot of them weren't paying too much attention to it. Uh, Others were in complete panic. They were told to stay at home. The, you know, the governor had a stay-at-home order, told to wash their hands, and they couldn't do either of those things. As time went on, um, we realized that, that actually how COVID impacted them the most was not COVID itself. But it was there was a lot less foot traffic coming by. So if they relied on panhandling, as I mentioned, off of Skid Row, there's very little resources. There were less. It, they were getting less money. Um, the places that they relied on as kind of lifeguards to use their bathrooms or showers or just get a drink um, were all closed with these with with uh, stay at home orders. Um, and then finally, if uh, I would say less than ten percent of our patients had phones um, or have phones that are reliable, and even those with phones didn't have a place to plug them in. So they became more and more isolated. And I thought this piece of wall work, wall art, um, really talked about it. So on the left, you see a happy person saying no shelter. And then right is somebody uh, that um, with the X's over their eyes wearing a mask saying shelter, um, indicating that, that they die going into shelter. So what this is in reference to is that the rates of COVID-19 were much, much higher in our shelters. Uh, up until this latest surge, we really had um, like very, very few cases uh, in the entire county of unsheltered with COVID-19. Under that, stay home equals go hungry, signed by the forgotten. Practice stay at home equals starvation, 
um, again, referencing the lack of food available off of Skid Row, um, and even less with uh, the stay-at-home orders, the you know, church groups or other people that would come by or were stopping coming by. Uh, get sick, get housed. Thank you, LASA. That's the Housing Service Authority. At least I have a room and a trailer before I die. Um, and these are the rooms and trailers that they were mentioning. So these are some of the things that, that LA did, uh, which are mirrored elsewhere around the country. I, I don't think we did anything that other people didn't do. Um, we had the isolation and quarantine sites for people who were symptomatic, Project Room Key, which were uh, hotels and motels for people who um, were at high risk for adverse events for COVID-19. Uh, the Park and Recreation start the, started these communal shelters and we kind of uh, warned about that because we were bringing people from off of the street into communal living. And they said, well, the beds are six feet apart. Well, th then the beds are, are well uh, separated, but not the people. The people won't stay in their beds, they move. Um, and even with all of that, um, over 40,000 were left unsheltered. So what we had to do with the people who were left unsheltered is really started this this uh, big education campaign. Um, you know, tried to learn what avenues they get their public health data. There was a lot of misinformation for all of us. So you can imagine the misinformation that was coming around to them. We taught them how to distance their camps. Um, tried to give a, a, away a, a lot of tents so that people didn't have to share tents. So you can see in this picture the way that um, everybody had their own tent. We, it was orderly and distanced in, in tents. Um, if somebody uh, either either didn't want to or wasn't able to get into one of the isolation and quarantine sites, we would uh, quarantine them in these places and educate their friends how to bring them food and, and get, give them all the PPE that they could need. So was it perfect? I don't, probably not, but uh, I think it was better than if we had never come out. And but in the end, we really worked just like, uh, you know, the values and philosophy is more important than the care, actually. Uh, we really looked at how the principles shape and inform policy. So we, we pushed for services to be patient-led or, or, or person-led. Um, for the project room key, for those hotels and motels, a reality-based exit strategy. So the initial thought was everybody coming in was going to leave with help. And we just knew that that wasn't going to be the case. So uh, we did what we don't typically do, and you know we like to stay on the street. But we went in and started caring for the folks in these sites because they really were very sick, um, knowing that the vast majority are going to be closing and they would go back onto the street. At this point, I don't know the exact percentage that are closed, but uh, but I know the majority are closed, and we have followed our people back out there that would have otherwise been lost. So I think. Um, that was not not great for them that they're going back out, but at least we know where they are. Um, and then, you know, the the uh, propensity to serve those who are easiest to reach versus those who are most in need. Um, the ones that are that are you know most happily engaged, uh, that you can go there once or twice and sign them up for a project room key, sign them up for housing. Uh, they're you know housing ready versus those that are the sickest. Um, and we're, we're really looking for those that are the sicker. Um, through the Street Medicine Institute, which I know was uh, mentioned in my introduction, but for those of you who are not familiar, the Institute is an international organization. Um, part of my role in the Institute is to provide technical assistance to about 140 programs around the world. We did publish street medicine practice during COVID-19 guidelines um, on, on kind of some of the information on how to distance encampments, how to approach encampments during COVID-19. Um, so here's the link. I don't know if, if these get sent out later, but you, you can go to the website, which is uh, streammedicine.org. And then finally, um, one of the things that we did notice about COVID-19, and I know this is a um, overused term now that we are all in this together, is that it really has been unifying for the street medicine movement. So this is my friend Isaac, um, who practices street medicine in Nigeria. Um, and they, uh, like many of us in the beginning, ran out of PPE. So he sent me this picture where all they had was gauze. 
Um, and he, you know, as you can see, he just wrapped gauze around his face um, as PPE. Uh, but even even not just us, I think it really has served to humanize the people that we serve. Uh, it's easier for us to think of them as others and assign you know them you know the saint versus sinner mentality that there's something different about them. They made these bad decisions that I would never make, so that's why they're in that position. But COVID-19 was not a bad decision that any of them made. So as things were closing, unemployment rates were going up. A lot of people that were previously housed found themselves waiting in the same lines as people experiencing homelessness. And I, and I think it served to humanize a typically uh, dehumanized and, and forgotten population. So I hope that's something that sticks with us even when the pandemic is over. Great, thank you so much, Brett. So actually, I want to thank all the speakers today, Dr. Mark Allenberry, Melody Barr, and Brett Feldman for this excellent and informative uh, presentation. Uh, before we proceed to the q and I just want to let everyone know that unfortunately, Dr. Derry had an urgent matter to attend to and had to leave. Um, so you can email your questions to him. His information is on the screen. So we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. There were a few questions in the, already in the chat box. Hey, Liz, this is Melody. Can you hear me? Yes, I know. So there was a couple questions that I just kind of wanted to give um, some slight responses to. Um, so one of the questions was around housing access that has become harder during COVID as many shelters have closed. And so I want to take that in a couple parts. So in Houston, um, and, and just like, you know, Dr. Feldman talked about, or Mr. Feldman talked about, you know, in terms of the um, – uh, coming together and getting creative. So in Houston, in order to adhere to the social distancing mandates, we would have had to have reduced our shelter capacity, um, I believe more, almost by half, with a little less than half, to accommodate that, uh, that particular mandate. And if we did that, we were going to lose quite a, few to quite a few of people that we had already had our hands on and were working with. So we, um, unfortunately, the city of Houston had to close down a lot of its facilities. And so one of those facilities, one of those facilities, we ended up making into an overflow shelter. In addition to that, we started utilizing our hotel stocks that were not being utilized um, for additional, um, what we call non-congregant shelter. And so, so it, it wasn't necessarily innovative. We did this during Hurricane Harvey, which I think gives you talked to us during that time at Hurricane Harvey, they would have told you it was innovative, but our, our community had already done some of this. The other thing that we did is, um, and, and I do see this across um, um, the nation, is that domestic violence has increased in a way that we've never seen it before. Um, and, and there's lots of reasons why. Um, however, we don't have time to um, uh, go into all the research as to why, but how do we actually help these individuals, these survivors flee? And so again, we utilize the hotel systems that, or the hotel units that weren't being occupied, and we are using those as non-congregate shelter. And so immediately we were able to increase our domestic violence capacity by 100 units, um, and that really came out to being close to like maybe 250, 300 heartbeats. And so that was, that was, um, that was something that, you know, was, um, was definitely needed. And then in terms of, um, I know there was another question, or maybe that's what those, those, that answers both of them. Um, I guess the new models, we were looking at non-congregate shelter. How do we shelter people where we can actually keep them more than six feet, but we're able to, um, to adhere to that, to the social distancing? And so that, really, that model is going to be non-congregate shelter and utilizing um, hotel type units. Yeah, for, for us, I think the innovation was um, the closest thing to a realization of a housing first model that I've seen being that, that uh, project room key. Um, you know, housing, housing first was designed to, you know, go out and, and the first thing you do is housing. So you go under the bridge, you take the person out of the bridge, put them in housing, and then you start working on things. And the reality is that um, housing has never been first. Uh, even in the housing first model, because there's paperwork you have to fill out, IDs, all kinds of stuff, and and it's 
still months of working uh, on on various things in order to get them housing first. You know, housing is somewhere down the line. The Project Room Key, uh, there's hotels and motels, w was actually the closest thing where um, within a day or two, a lot of them found themselves in these motels. Um, and there was very little support in terms of, um, you know, when we think of housing first and we wrap around all these services around them, um, and there was very little support in these motels um, but it was also low barrier. So there were no, uh, you know, they were allowed to use whatever substances they were interested in using. Um, and I think the results were really impressive and, and were only, and I, I don't know how we're going to appreciate them, but really just the value of housing alone um, in moving people along, just giving them a safe place to stay that they know they're going to be able to come back to, uh, food was, was provided for them, um, and, and just the wonders that we saw uh, result from that. Um, I do see a, a question in the chat from uh, Comfort. Was there a provider who rounded on these people? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, the street medicine model, a, a typical team, as we call it, is a provider, so it's um, doctor, PA, or nurse practitioner, uh, a uh, RN, and then a community health worker. The community health worker role is a little bit different. In street medicine, it's the ideal person is somebody with lived expertise in homelessness, um, and, and their job is essentially the street guide. They know the streets better than anybody. They know where the people are at all times, and then and along with the nurse, help create the schedule for when the provider's on street rounds, um, and there's a, it's pretty heavy provider time too, like three days a week. Um, and then when we're there, the community health worker becomes situational awareness so that uh, the providers can focus 100% on the patient. So that's, that's who makes up the model. Hey, thank you both. Hi, this is John Nelson. Hi, this is John Nelson from the NCRC, and I just wanted to answer a couple of questions since Dr. Dari is not on the call right now um, from Lori and from Axel, that a, a lot of the, the, there have been many smaller studies. Um, there was a systematic review, though, and I think that, um, done this, that, that was published this last summer, of people with HIV and COVID, and I think overall, um, people with HIV are equally at risk of getting and dying from COVID, uh, from SARS-CoV-2. Um, the issue, though, is that of those that die, that they are significantly more likely um, than those that do not die um, of people with HIV to ha be over 50 years old and to have multimorbidities, which we know also increase the risk of people without HIV such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, um, diabetes, COPD. Um, and so though that's, and because our, our population of people with HIV in the United States is aging, we are seeing more and more people over 50. Um, and with aging comes comorbidities um, for, for some, and particularly people that have been living with, with HIV. Um, so I, I think, I don't know if that answers both of your questions, but, but um, I know there was some concern or some hope maybe at the beginning that being on antiretrovirals somehow protects people. Um, it does not um, from what the, the studies are showing. Um, but we also know that people that are not, um, do not have, an, have very many T cells, particularly significantly over 200, they don't do as well either. So we want people on antiretrovirals, but all precautions need to be taken to prevent um, infection with COVID among people with HIV um, and, and definitely um, looking at the, the comorbidities um, that often occur with, with people aging with HIV. Thank you, John. Now, Melody, you were going to, did you want to follow up on any of those other questions? 
Well, the one thing I was thinking about, and uh, when we talk about like new models, or uh, I'd like to expand, and it wasn't necessarily a you know a question that was asked, but something new that uh, comes to mind in terms of how we're dealing with our nonprofits or with our providers. And so um, I know there's a lot of clinicians on the phone, but I know there's also a lot of Ryan White um, um, agencies that utilize that fund and. Specifically, I'm thinking about like linkage to care. I'm thinking about the people that are um, seeing clients um, day in and day out. What we have started having conversations with our agencies um, in terms of funding is really looking at that piece of professional development that we don't always look at. So under um, the two CFR 200, which is just your cost principles, and you know every federal organization has to uh, utilize that. Professional development is an allowable cost, and if you connect your professional development with an actual mental health aspect for your um, case managers, for your frontline workers, that's something to start thinking about differently. So what COVID has really um, brought to light within our organizations is that burnout has become much quicker. We are, it feels like we are in an active disaster and a normal active disaster will last maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Um, we've been in this disaster since March and it doesn't seem to be letting up. And the thought is that when the moratorium does release or has, you know, some something happens with that moratorium and we see more persons that have never been affected in that way, your frontline workers are going to have that trauma that they're not necessarily accustomed to because it's going to be at a higher level. So what are we as organizations, what is our social responsibility to our staff to make sure that they are also mentally fit to continue to provide the much needed service to the community? So it's something to think about. I don't think we necessarily hear funders talk about, hey, are you providing mental health services to your staff? But that may start to be the new way of thinking if we want to continue to do this good work long term. Thank you, Melody. Begin to open up to additional questions. I think you can use the chat or you can unmute yourself by pressing pound six. So just a, um, some additional questions that were in the chat earlier. I don't know if this was addressed, uh, but Georgette Diophilus had mentioned it seems like housing access has become harder during COVID as many shelters have closed to new people. Have you learned of any new innovative housing models developed during this time? Um, yeah, I was uh, talking about that one with, with uh, Project Room Key and the, the hotel and motel room. For, for uh, are they, people who are, who are at high risk for COVID. Are there any other additional questions in the chat box? So at this time, I just want to once again thank today's speakers and all of our participants for joining us today for this session. Again, this session is part of a seven-part series uh, um, hosted by the AATC and CRC in collaboration with the AATC program. Uh, to learn more about the series and to see the recording and access the PDF file for this um, presentation, you can go on to the website, the the AATC and CRC website, the link is here as well as in the chat box. Uh, again, so I just want to hand it over to, to Brett or Melody, are there any final um, words, uh, anything else you want to share um, before we um, close today's session? No, not for me. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. No, no I'm good. Just, you know, I do, I do want to just say thank you for all the hard work that everyone's doing up on this call. 
We really appreciate it. It definitely takes um, a village. So thank you. Great. Th again, thank you both. So it, um, our next session will be on January 11th on self-care resiliency and stress management for healthcare providers. We hope to see you then. Thank you and have a wonderful day.